Peter Barnett, and Michelle Douglas, they are still in the of the Department of Digital Arts and Culture. Some of you will probably remember that my colleague and I spoke last fall about the Eagle Art Exchange in Fifth Avenue. I look at that again because the most recent aspect of our department is giving its name to the Department of Digital Arts and Culture. Our department is unique. In the case of the site, the same length of time, the new apartments began to rise around it, and it took off new streets starting to come to it. In 1930, Rockefeller then went to the city of New York and made a pack of land to the church of the United States for a final place. With the understanding that four acres 
occupy the other part during the fourth week of the century. The following year, the Boston based architect Charles Paul, who had just completed the Riverside Church, was contracted to work on the design of the new structure together with Joseph Church, who later became the representative of the future church. From 1931 to 1933, Paul Lincoln Brett became the closest correspondent of the city about the design of the new center. Called in the course of all time, this correspondence provides detailed documentation of the involvement of the design scheme. We learned that Paul Lincoln Brett took himself in a general monastic plan for the future museum, a choice suggested by the predominant reason to suggest the formation of the collection. In the 1931 report, Brett eloquently justifies the use of the monastic plan, pointing out that the medieval church, with its sculpture, its decoration of painting, its symbol, its presence of metalwork and illumination, was in itself a veritable museum. Since it is difficult to install in a cluster of many of the city's people in Arlington, it would seem appropriate to face the plan of the museum. Of the new movement upon that of the medieval church, or more particularly, upon that of the monastic church of the first year of the That also saw as an advantage the fact that no specific rules governed the design of the medieval monastery, and that various parts of any functional monastery were often added on or modified over time, resulting in an anonymous structure of decoration and design. His own vision flexibility and adaptability served well to ever expand this collection, for between 1926 and 1933, which was the final design of the city, many purchases and gifts from the composers and regions of the media continued to augment the original collection, obliging the architects to incorporate an ever wider variety of objects into the museum's structure. Besides the monastic plan, Without its copy and change of the original monastery, what to be taken? The more daunting challenge was to determine how to incorporate the historical fragments into a 20th century structure. Let us look at the deconstructed cloister comprising fragments from St. Mary's to the Egyptian Arab founded in the 9th century. This deconstruction was marked with the efforts of Joseph Brett and, following the sometime defense in August of 1933, Although a cloister by definition is a courtyard open to the sun, very early on in its design, had the fragments separated to put architect's carving and visitors protected against the rain, and therefore they needed to be removed anyway. Indeed, the Sandia fragments include some of the most exquisite carvings in our collection, some inspired by sandstone, others such as the Institute of Research Management. Collins and Brett also sought to suggest somehow that the original was a double stone cloister. The design of French monastery had long ago become too valid to offer any useful tools for the reconstruction. William had decided to adapt the tiles of the Arkansas into another cloister that attracted even the eye in Provence, hoping to achieve two purposes. First, that the tiles of the would suggest a second story, and second, that it would allow a flat glass roof to cover the center court to the new room, making its presence less immediate from the surrounding vaulted walkway. The projection of a second story was especially meaningful since most of the fragments of the cluster are believed to have come from the original cluster's second story, generally dated to the end of the first century. At the time when the monastery enjoyed great popularity as an important pilgrimage destination. The covered walls surrounding the reconstructed cluster in New York are most likely inspired by the cluster of Montmartre, which is also covered by stone walls with two large transverse arches supported by carved pillars. The tiles of course by St. Mary, namely the reassembly of a group of dispersed fragments were resolved by shifting sentiments in other historical and stylistically comparable monuments. The word precedent is found many times in the correspondence between architects and curators, used to indicate an architectural campaign such as the vault, the gate, 
that even the court is over law, founded in a description of the Torah of the or in publication of the Torah in the Bible architecture, which was then used as a picture of which a similar component could be designed for the Hebrew today. We see, for example, in the entry door to the question, the so called question here, and unlisted for the reference to a doorway as to a certain monastery or some cell in some sense. A pregnant with rounded arch door was modified into a subtle pointed arch to complement the Gothic character of the vestibule behind. Another example is found in the north corner of the museum, which doesn't have color, small window, and multiple details, which used to follow the Gothic ceiling of the small church of Montfontaine in southern France. The structure coincides with the vestibule character. The reconstruction of the cloister from the Benedictine monastery of San Francisco poses a different set of problems. Such as the same sacred sanctuary, elements of the 12th century Kunta cloister, which burst throughout the region, had emerged in many instances to provide a clear sense of its original dimension. The limited number of fragments purchased by Fano in the first decade of the 20th century allowed its reconstruction at any cost as the original site. At the end of March of 1931, during the nascent stage of the design process, it was decided that Kutschel would serve as the focal point of the museum. Fragment arrangements to purchase more of the king's marble freshly extracted from old quarries near Kutschel in order to create a harmonious reconstruction and has become one of the most frequented locations of the museum. If you scroll down one of the corridors today, or peek through the Chicago House of Mother Earth Central, the unique contemplative atmosphere is only disturbed by the fantastic animals caught on the vessels of time. These animated images remind us of famous letters written by the Lord Chardin, who protects his impression against the scripture of Martin, but on the same edge as the Greek line. The whimsical and sometimes bold depictions found in these two sarcophagus continue to compel many of us to connect the famous Simon, for now at last in the 12th century, with his rather weak even marble than in the head. While making sure that the general layout of the cloister does not fit well with Kutzel's search of the trial, the story of an architect also sought to strike a fine balance between the buildings in scripture and the vestibule. In the broad sense, they wish to provide a clear confrontation between the museum indoors and outdoors, including the relationship between the museum and fourth final part, so that the master of the exterior would harmonize with its rustic surroundings to create in Robert Bell's work a prominent and pointed interest in the architectural design of the park. Or, as Thomas put it, the building was to give an impression that it had simply ground out of the rock on which it is built and to become part of the earth itself. In addition, Thomas created intimate embrasures and window openings throughout the building, carefully framing the picturesque views of the rustic court final part, the Hudson River flowing by, and the expansive concrete of the new building. This experience is same framing throughout also within the gallery. From the early Gothic chapel into the Gothic chapel to a beautiful second century bathroom window, or from the Renaissance tapestry room to a 16th century window into the Kutschel cloister. 1934 brought more architectural functions to the collection. In that year, George Blumenthal, who now served as collector and president of the California Museum from 1934 to 41, dismantled the music room from his farm in Paris. Lorimer and Collins visited the collection, itself a reconstruction of a small church from the countryside of their town, to handpick fragments they wanted for the cloister, which Blumenthal generously sent to the museum. One of the fragments was this doorway from an Augustinian priory in the Renaissance, near Clermont Ferrand in South Coast France. Having served as the entrance room to Blumenthal's plans and interests, Today, each note visitor entering the French Grand Cloister. Among Blumenthal's main gifts were a set of glass door windows originated from a Dominican convent in Spain. 
and also become a part of that in trouble in the end. The fourth thing to talk about is that the fundamental point that the church and monastery in the Western Church was that the trouble was required as late as 1935 and partly added to the divine church that the final model of the Western Church is here. The inclusion of the chapter of our another important dimension to our understanding of the life of God in the Middle Ages. Often situated in the history of the church of the fourth century, the chapter of is never far from the Middle Ages, the Red Sea of the Church, or the places where several significant objects from the Middle Ages are kept. Together, these words form the religious nucleus of the monastery. The subdued sculptural program of the Pompeii chapter house offers a striking contrast with the larger images found in many of the capitals of the church of the monastery. Metal rings still dangling from the two central columns are vivid reminders of the post revolution history of the throne from the use of the barn for horses and food. A good portion of the general public believes, mistakenly, that the cloister had been built originally as a monastery, or that it had been a monastery transplanted from Europe. Frustrating as it is for those of us trying to explain the history of the museum, these misconceptions are in fact part of the complement for those involved in the design and construction. They created a complex of indoor and outdoor spaces, which not only helped some of the greatest objects from the Middle Ages, but also, not least, preserve the air 